Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night's Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension, Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night by Zoom 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you two folks, Margaret Mooney, who's with the um, Cooperative Institute for Meteorological Satellite Studies, and Dixie Burbank, who is a photographer and uh, runs her own business on travel and photography. Um, I'm going to ask both of you the five questions. If it's all right, Dixie, I'll ask you first, and then I'll ask Margaret. Dixie, where were you born? I was born in Portage, Wisconsin. <sighs> a and long ways away. <laughs> it is. But it's, a, it's a long carry. And um, where did you go to high school? I went to high school in Lodi. Lodi, excellent. And did you go to college? I did. I went, I, my bachelor's degree was at University of Wisconsin La Crosse in health education and psychology. And I just completed my master's degree at University of Wisconsin Whitewater in occupational safety and health. I completed it in, in 2018. Excellent. That's great stuff. And then when did you start your business? Um, I actually, it's, it's a side, it, it's not an actual business. It's, it's kind of a side business. Yeah. And I haven't um, really organized it into a business status. I've actually done it for the love of the chase of the Aurora and to offer opportunities to people that otherwise would never go and would not afford it. Mm -hmm. And so I can talk a little bit more about what I do um, it's basically group travel at, um, you know, family, family type travel into Airbnb houses. We cooperatively cook together and chase the Aurora and we go to places that people wouldn't dream of going. Outstanding. So it's more of an enterprise than a business right, right now. Right. Yeah. Purification. And then Margaret, how's it going, Margaret? Going great, Tom. Thanks. Thanks for doing this again. Um, everybody, Margaret and I have been doing this um, for what, five, six years. Um, do you want to tell folks about the high school camp that is going on? Well, I work on campus, as Tom said, NOAA's Cooperative Institute for Meteorological Satellite Studies. And we've had a camp since 1991. So since before I worked here, and we have an in-person camp for one week with high school students every year. Well, this year, because of the pandemic, um, we have it online, but around six years ago, Tom was looking for a speaker, summer speaker. And I said, boy, if we could have it during our camp, you know, I'll get you one. And then he let me do it every, every uh, summer this week in June. You're At this time, it, yeah. yeah. That's the only way I could present really is because I got to pick the presenter. <laughs> <laughs> way to go. And Margaret, where were you born? Oceanside, California. And where'd you go to high school? I went to St. Stephen's Catholic High School in Saginaw, Michigan. I'm telling you all that because I went to the same school from kindergarten to senior year. And every summer, myself and seven other uh, women of my young age get together. Um, and so eight of us get together every summer. And we all went to the same school forever. Oh, that's pretty special, right? That is. That's 13 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Regarding through high school. That's a yeah. Lot. Oh, I thought you meant, yeah, sure. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I just, oh, I'm a bad person. All good. Um, and then where'd you go for your undergrad? U of M, Ann Arbor. I grew up in Michigan. Good. And your advanced degrees, if any? I had one, and it was from UW La Follette. Oh, and La Follette, La Follette School of Public Policy. Okay, very good. So tonight we get to hear about two points of view of the Aurora Borealis from the satellites and from the ground. I'm looking forward to Margaret and Dixie's presentation. Thank you both very much for talking with us here on one of the longest days of the year. It's mm -hmm. great to have a sun-powered talk uh, this time of year. So whoever's going to start, go ahead and begin. Okay. That'd be me. And it should go now. Got it? Looks good. Okay, great. Um, 
This is Margaret and I'm working, I'm in my office on campus right now and I'm excited to be able to talk about one of the favorite parts of my job. And that is looking at the Aurora Borealis from satellite imagery. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of the science, but just the basics. And these slides were provided by Dr. Liz McDonald. She works at NASA and she started a citizen science project called Aurorasaurus. And if you wanna look it up, you can. There's a lot of resources there and uh, it seems like a great group. So a common misconception apparently is that the aurora is uh, particles from the sun, but it turns out that's only part of the recipe. You also need Earth's magnetic field. So it's a two part thing. Another misconception is that the aurora only occurs during solar storms, but they happen all the time, even in the day and at both poles. Another common misconception is that we've got it down, we understand the aurora, it's all understood. But in fact, uh, just the basics are well understood and many are not. One of the problems is we do not have global satellite images of the aurora. So there's gaps in the knowledge and the models need uh, improvement also. So I'll talk a little bit more about the global satellite uh, issue uh, in the second little part of after these misconception slides are gone. So another one is that the aurora is static. It is not. It's only static in photographs or in satellite images. Um, it's actually extremely active and you have to observe it to appreciate it. Another misconception <clears throat> is that Earth's magnetic field is static. It is not. This is just a, a, an artist rendering, but NASA has a satellite mission to study the magnetic field. And this is what we think it looks like. So when solar material impacts the magnetic sphere, electrons in nearer space stream down the field lines towards Earth poles. And then there they interact with oxygen and nitrogen particles in the upper atmosphere, and they release photons to create the aurora. And then another misconception, Aurora is well behaved. It is not. Uh, this is a quote from a citizen science. If you've seen one storm, well, you've seen one storm. We'll just watch this for a minute or two. I'm sure Dixie has some pretty cool stuff to share too. This makes me want to take one of Dixie's trips. I kind of want to go to Iceland though too, because then you can see reindeer. So you can see why it'd be nice to have a, a satellite uh, with a instrument that could watch the aurora continuously. But we don't have that right now. So here are those misconceptions summarized. Um, you need both energy from the sun and our, our magnetosphere. Aurora happens all the time. I think that's pretty fascinating. Um, and it's not, it's still, there's still a lot to learn about it. It's not static. The magnetic field is not static. And then I do like that quote, if you've seen one storm, you've seen one storm. Here's just a schematic. So you've got the energy from the sun charging towards the Earth's atmosphere. And then our magnetic field kind of uh, ushers those uh, electro, uh, the energy from the sun toward our poles. And then when it interacts with um, oxygen and nitrogen atoms in the Earth's atmosphere, we get the aurora. So like I said, just the basics. So now the stuff that uh, I am excited about are things like this. This is a satellite image of the aurora. And it was downloaded from the roof of our building and processed in our building. And this is from the SUMI NPP satellite in September 2017. Currently, there is only one instrument lying on only two satellites able to detect the aurora. The satellites are the SUMI NPP so, uh, and the NOAA 20 satellite. And the instrument is called the Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite. It has a sensor on it 
called the day night band and the day night band is where the magic happens. The day night band can detect the aurora. So some of you might notice that name when uh, you read on that satellite that says SUMI NPP. And in fact, uh, this is the first earth observing satellite to be named after a scientist. And that scientist was from the University of Wisconsin Madison. It's Dr. Werner Sumi. And uh, when he was here doing research, uh, Russia launched Sputnik. So that was a spacecraft, the first spacecraft to orbit Earth. And Dr. Vern Sumi was a meteorologist. He had a colleague, Dr. Robert Parent, who was an engineer. And they had the idea, we should put instruments on satellites to study Earth. And uh, NASA and NSF, that's the National Science Foundation, liked the idea so much. They gave this whole building that I'm in right now to the UW to do satellite remote sensing. And we've been doing it here ever since. Um, if you're on campus, it's a tall building with satellite dishes on top of it. You can't miss it. This is just a short, very short clip. So there's a, a schematic of what, or, or an artist's rendering of what the satellite looks like, a large solar panel. You know, we spend a lot of energy getting them into space, but after that, they uh, operate off solar energy. And then you could see how the JPSS satellite collects a swath of data below it. So it's going pole to pole, the Earth is spinning below it, and so the satellite is always seeing a different part of the Earth, even though it's in the same orbit, we're just using the fact that the Earth is uh, rotating below the satellite's orbit. Um, and then uh, this is a JPSS satellite that refers to a series of satellites. So first we had the SUMI NPP, that was a joint uh, mission between NOAA and NASA. And then we had the NOAA, NOAA 20, which is actually JPSS-1. And there's four of them in that series. The next one's gonna be launched next year. And the exciting part of that is starting next year, we'll have uh, VIRS day-night band imagery from three satellites, so three opportunities to see the aurora at night. So the day-night band collects electromagnetic energy through a bandwidth of 500 to 900 nanometers. And this is where atomic oxygen and molecular nitrogen is. So um, that's why we can detect the aurora with it. But the images that come from the day-night band are a combination of all the energy within that bandwidth. And it doesn't, you can't separate out the colors like green or red or, you know, the amazing aurora colors that we're used to from photographs. We just get a, a gray, a gray image, a grayscale image, but they're still pretty cool and I'll show you lots of them. And the cool thing is that the day night band is ultra sensitive to low light conditions and can detect lights at night, including the aurora but it's not very good at detecting the aurora during a full moon. And that's because the contrast is gone. This is gonna to toggle back and forth. And you can see when there's a full moon, you can see clouds really well, you can see snow cover, you can see some other things. But when there's no moon, you can see uh, things like the aurora and even air glow and other things, um, low light things. Um, so you really, you really get used to and get good at looking at these images uh, at different moon lights, different varying lights. Here's an example. In the top image, we have the winter in Wisconsin. I think most people can pick out Wisconsin there and Lake Superior. And the moon is almost 90% full. And what we're seeing there, that swath, is a new uh, snowfall. So we can see the storm track of a winter storm and the fresh snow on the ground. Um, and then some clouds also over Michigan and uh, further off to the, to the west and north. Meanwhile, the lower image, the moon is about 30% full and you can really see the aurora. There's great contrast. Um, you can still see the city lights because they make their own light and the aurora makes its own light. But uh, it's really nicer to look at uh, images of the aurora, aurora borealis if um, the moon is you know, less than half full or set. But here's an image from April of this year where we had a full moon and the aurora. 
So this is a pretty cool image. And this is one of the reasons day night band is so wonderful to look at. So there's a, a storm system off the East Coast of the United States. And you can, you can see that cold front kind of stretching off shore of Florida. And then you see those little white flashes. Well, they're lightning. That's lightning streaks making its own light. Obviously, you can see city lights. But this night, there was also a really strong aurora. So we could see that also. And this is just a stunning image, a stunning overnight image. So this has uh, this um, animated GIF shows a month's worth of day-night band images. And you can see how sometimes in the month you can see the clouds and other times you can see the city lights in the darkness. Um, we make this uh, imagery available every day from both these satellites. And there's the roof of our building. So you probably have noticed it. And I've got a circle, an oval circle around the satellite dish that, that downloads polar orbiting data. It looks like a radar, but in fact, there's a satellite dish inside that dome. And the reason it's inside that dome, that canvas, is because the satellite dish tracks the polar orbiting satellite while they pass overhead. And that canvas protects the gears. And the other reason it looks like a radar, here's a fun fact most people don't know. The, uh, Madison had a National Weather Service office at the airport. That's actually why I moved to Madison was to work for the National Weather Service. And that is two thirds of the radar tower that was at the airport. We, uh, they got a helicopter in here and they, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle. We're reusing that radar tower. So anyways, you can look at Veers today and the day night band imagery via this web page. And it's gonna be downloaded from this uh, satellite dish and processed in our building and made available, but it's only the United States. To look at the Aurora, we need to see imagery from Canada. And I've tried to, uh, you know, I've written grant proposals to try to make that something that's um, available to everyone every day. And so far I haven't been successful, but I haven't given up yet either. There is a, a data, a visualization platform out of our building called Real Earth. And it can uh, offer you composites like this of the Aurora. So this is obviously super cool. The only problem is that you can see practically every uh, product from practically every satellite in real Earth. So it's kind of hard to find the Veers day-night band. You can find it, but it's a little bit harder to find because there's so much to available there. Meanwhile, one thing I do, because I'm kind of addicted to this type of imagery, is I look almost every morning to see what's come in from the day-night band imagery. And if it's cool, I share it on social media. So this is a SUMI NPP from April 2019, a really stunning aurora. And obviously, the moon was not very bright or had set. Another amazing example this time, uh, SUMI NPP again, March 2019. You can see it's just north of the Great Lakes mainly. Here's the NOAA 20 satellite. So the SUMI NPP was launched um, like three years before the NOAA 20. So we have a little bit more SUMI NPP imagery, but the NOAA 20 uh, has the same instrument with the same uh, uh, resolution, the same everything, the VIRS and the day-night band. Uh, here's another SUMI NPP from 2019 on a very dark night. NOAA 20, 2018 in March. And you can see that the, or you can probably tell that the moon is a little bit brighter because we can see clouds down below. It's a fabulous image, a little bit more zoomed in north of the Great Lakes in Wisconsin. This is NOAA 20 in 2018. I just love this one, SUMI NPP from 2017. You can see where, why I might get addicted to this sort of, uh, thing. NOAA 20 from October 2020. This almost looks like flowing hot, a uh, hot river of fire flowing in the West Coast. That's uh, Vancouver and Seattle and uh, Portland there, those lights and the lights right in the middle there, that's Calgary and Edmonton, those ones in Canada. Well, here's something that it's interesting, but not that fun. That's the North Dakota um, uh, fracking fields. So that's uh, gas flares from a fracking field. 
which we also can see on day-night band imagery. Oops. Uh, this is NOAA 20 from March of this year. And so one thing that um, I'm kind of interested in that I've also tried to get funding for, but haven't been successful with yet. Um, I uh, shared this image of the, of the Aurora in May of 2019, and I shared it on, on social media. And a photographer named Paul Nelson wrote and said, hey, I was standing on the shore of Lake Superior, and I took hundreds of images, um, if you, if you want to see any of them. So we, we said, well, do you have one from this exact time? And he said, sure. And he shared it with us. And so there it is. His name is Paul Nelson. And um, then my colleague, William Straka, uh, found out the aperture width of Paul's camera and you know his exact location using GPS and whatnot, and then uh, put these two together. So you can see, basically, I think, the shape of the aurora, uh, both from above and below with this little case study. And then again, this year, same thing, I shared this image on social media and uh, Locke, uh, Donna Locke, I'm sorry, her, her uh, Twitter, Twitter handle is at Locke Donna, um, said, well, I took a, you know, hundreds or I don't know, dozens of pictures, from Manitoba, would you like to see them? And I said, well, there's, here's the time of the satellite overpass, if you can share that with us. So we did this little case study I think it's pretty cool, but we haven't been successful with funding, so it's hard to make, it's time consuming to make these case studies. So I'm not sure how many more we'll get to do unless I get successful with a grant. So that is all I have. Uh, Dixie, I'll stop sharing. Okay. And you, you can take over. Am I muted? No. Okay, so let me share my screen. And I'm going to go share. All right. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, hang on just a second. There we go. Um, just a little bit different from, uh, from Margaret's. Um, but basically, it's, it, it, it's the same thing, you know, similar. But when I put together this presentation, my thought was, what do I do as an Aurora chaser? What stats are important to me? And when will I know there'll be activity or think there'll be activity? When is it basically worth for me to go out and look? Um, because I have traveled to Alaska and Norway and Finland and um, several places, I've had several trips to Alaska several times a year, I'm a little spoiled. So unless I'm gonna have some really, really super activity right in my backyard, I, I don't usually go out anymore. I used to go out every time I had a remote chance of catching anything. So basically what I wanna talk about a little bit, uh, I have to move this window, there we go. Um, there are a couple things that, um, that a couple of uh, things that help us to look at the data. And I wanna talk about basically the Solar Dynamics Observatory imaging it provides a first glance at possible aurora activity. Now, this is obviously not imaging, it's all the data and it's looking at various different space weather um, uh, topics or, or, um, or items. And so um, the two satellites right now that give us the most information are the Discover satellite and the A satellite. And what they do is they record things that pass them and are on their way to Earth. And they also record images of sunspots, of coronal holes, of any activity that's that's on the sun. And so there's a couple different things that we look at. We look at a BT value, we will look at a BZ value. And I, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in depth. Uh, but the BT value, basically, it tells us the strength of the um, magnetic field. And we want it to exceed 10 NT. Um, what the BT does is it, it more or less caps off the BZ. So we're, if the BZ is at 10, I'm sorry, the BT is at 10, the BZ can only be at minus or plus 10. And what BZ is, is actually the speed. It's actually speed and direction of the, of the wind that's coming off of the sun. And we want that wind for uh, 
for the Great Lakes area and the northern tier states, we want that wind to be southward or negative. That pushes it. And again, this is very much layman's terms because I'm not the scientist. I know exactly what to look for, but I can't, I'm not, I'm not the one that's going to explain all the details, but I know that BZ and BT are the two values that I look at. And then I look at, at, at the speed of the solar wind. And of course, the faster, the better. So, um, also, data changes so fast, they change, it, 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 they're very short term. So you have to kind of look at it and look at what the effects can be. Um, it, the effect can be 40 to 50 minutes later. Usually when this information passes these satellites, that wind speed tells us approximately how long it's going to take for that to reach the Earth. So why is that not forwarding for me? There we go. So some common mistakes. You hear a lot, if you're, if you're paying attention to the Aurora community, you hear a lot about KP. The KP index is zero through nine, and you hear people go, oh, it's supposed to be a KP five tonight. It's supposed to be a KP six, KP four, KP three. Basically what KP is, it's an indicator of all of this data. They put it together and they put it on this simplified scale, but it is a, um, it's data from the past three hours. So they use that data and they say, okay, based on the past three hours, we think this is what it's going to do. It's an estimate for the next three hours, six hours, nine hours. And spaceweather.com does a lot of forecasting. They, they use a lot of the KP. For, uh, for us as, as on the ground um, chasers, we we don't look at that. We, we try not to look at the KP. And instead we look at what the basic uh, wind speed BT, BZ and the gigawatts are. On are. Um, the gigawatts is the, the actual size of the Aurora Oval and I'll, and I'll discuss that a little bit. So basically we don't wanna look at the past, we wanna look at the future and we wanna be able to catch substorms and a, a KP can't tell us when all of a sudden we're gonna have this immediate activity. So we definitely want to um, look at the stats. So basically, obviously we know that the, that, um, the creation or, or the, the aurora is created it, it from the sun. It's sun's plasma, it's sun's wind, it's anything that comes out of the sun that's actually gonna come and, and hit our atmosphere or, and, and cause a magnetic field change. And so the energy is pumped in and of course, everything, when it's charged and excitable, that is what creates the lights. And so a simulation video, this is just like what Margaret's just a little bit slightly different, but it's only at 50 seconds. And it basically shows the information or the, the um, type of wind or plasma or whatever is gonna come off the sun first. And you'll notice a sunspot, a lot of uh, flares are created out of sunspots. And again, comes in, circles around our magnetosphere. And then it excites, it excites the particles. So basically, there are a couple different ways that we um, that we get uh, information, or we get plasma, or we get some type of a, of a charge from the sun. And so the first one is co-rotating interaction regions. What that basically means is that we might have gotten a coronal hole airstream, and it may be a slow stream coming off of the sun. And then all of a sudden, a fast solar wind occurs. And when this solar wind, this fast solar wind collides with the slower stream, it creates a shock. And these create very short term auroras, but they can trigger aurora shows that are, you know, magnificent shows for a short period of time. Um, so these do frequently happen. And we've got a lot of uh, people that are on these aurora Facebook groups that they watch all of these and they watch all this data. Um, the most, uh, uh, probably a more common is the coronal holes. And basically it's open regions in the sun that accelerate the solar wind. It, it pumps it outward. They're low density or high speed solar winds. Um, they, they absolutely are more active on an 11 year solar cycle. So I don't know if you've heard about solar minimum and solar maximum, 
but it's thought that there are there is an 11 year solar cycle. And so we're gonna have a lot of sun activity every 11 years. And then every 11 years, we're gonna have very little sun activity. And so we've just passed through solar minimum. It's thought that probably 2019 to 2020 was probably a solar minimum. So we're on a new solar cycle right now, heading up to solar max. They figure solar max is gonna be 2024, 25, 26, somewhere around in there. When I first got started in, um, in traveling to Alaska and actually paying attention to all the details and all the webcams that I looked at all over the world, when I actually got involved in that was probably closer to a solar max. We were, we were gearing up to a solar max. So there was a lot of activity at that time. And so depending on the size, solar, solar wind speeds can remain elevated for several days. So this is a type of event that when it happens, the news media picks it up and says, oh, for the next two, three days, we can have auroras. But what they're doing is they're also looking at KP. They're not looking at all of this detail and, and say, okay, what is causing this and how long is it causing it? And it, it, is, are, is it really likely to be auroras in our area? So, um, the coronal holes, the thing that, that's really neat about them is that a lot of times they stay um, on, the, on the sun. And so there's a 27 day forecast where it comes back around or rotation comes back around and the coronal, coronal hole could still be valid and still be active. And so we can almost say that on a 27 day, day period, we're gonna have more activity again. And then the most, you know, what everybody looks for are the coronal mass ejections or the CMEs. And this is where plasma erupts from the, from the atmosphere of the sun. It actually is in a filament, it explodes out and we like them to be earth directed. Now we don't want them to be dead on earth directed because it could cause major blackouts in our, in our electrical system or electrical grid. And so an example of a filament basically is this video. And this is a filament eruption with a CME. So plasma is actually ejected. Not all filament eruptions or, not, or solar flares have this plasma in it. So what we want is we want that plasma and we want that to come, you know, come into our atmosphere, um, puncture our, our magnetosphere and get in, into where, you know, where it's close enough to cause the auroras. And so, you know, when we see these, then we're excited about it because we know we've got, depending upon the speed, we know we have two days, three days, and we're going to have some auroral activity. Depending upon, again, that BZ, and I'll go, I'm going to go over that one more time, is which direction it's going to puncture and whether it's going to come south and, and give the, the lower 48 states a view. So our data comes from um, from different satellites. And again, I talked about Discover. I talked about the ACE satellite. Um, ACE was replaced by Discover. Discover went down for a while. Now Discover is back into functionality. Um, what this data does, it creates what we call the ovation model or the auroral oval. And what that is, is, it, is that they use this data and they go, this is more than likely where viewing is gonna occur of, of the aurora. So this is what we look for. We look for what does that oval look like? And um, where, you know, how strong is it? How, how, you know, what's all the information? So basically I talked about BT, talked about BZ. So the BT, you want higher than 10, but again, whatever level that BT is, that's the maximum positive or negative that a BZ can be. And we want that BZ to be as negative as possible because we want that to come south. So now I'm in Alaska, I don't have to have a huge negative BZ number to get activity because Alaska is right under that Aurora Oval. Fairbanks is, is probably prime, prime under the oval. Uh, one of the questions that we just had in the chat group was, where are you most likely to see these? And my answer is Northern Norway. Lapland, Finland, um, the Lapland areas of Finland, Norway, and Sweden. The reason why I'm going to answer it that way is because magnetic north is just slightly closer to that area than it is to Alaska. So because magnetic north is a little bit closer, more of Norway and more of Lapland is underneath that oval. So their viewing is going to be more frequent. Unfortunately, they have about 50% cloud cover. So you have to get there on the right nights. Uh, Fairbanks still, you know, great activity. You're under the oval. 
they say that if you're in Fairbanks more than three nights, you're more than likely to see them. I've been up there when it's been miserable snowstorms, but I've also been up there when there's been absolutely activity every single night. And so we look at that minus BZ number. Um, as an example, I can, I, right now we have to be at, at what people would think would be a KP5 level to see anything uh, that's, that's, that, that's above the horizon enough to make a difference when you're in, in Wisconsin. Um, in Alaska, they can be at a KP zero. And because that BZ tilts south or negative, they'll get activity in Alaska just about every single night. So these are kind of important numbers to look at when, you, when you're actually going to go out to chase. So solar wind speed, the average speed is 300 to 350 kilometers per second. Elevated is 400. High speed is, is 500. We want to see it as high as possible. We want to see coronal mass ejections and coronal holes. We want to see that elevate that solar wind. And so we're going to look at all those numbers. What's the speed? What's the BZ? What's the BT? And what that all forms the gigawatts, which is, the, which is how bright and how active are your auroras going to be. So this is what the ovation model looks like. And basically, 0 to 30 is dim. Now, if I'm in the Arctic Circle, at 0 to 30 gigawatts, I'm going to see auroras. I am not going to see anything in this area unless I'm over 50. 30 to 50 um, in northern Minnesota, maybe northern Wisconsin, you're going to get some horizon activity, but you're not going to see anything dynamic or anything really, uh, you know, great to see until you're over 50 down here. And you're still going to see it basically at the horizon. You're not going to see it overhead or you're not going to see it very high in the sky. And so your gigawatts determines how bright and how active your aurora is going to be. Real-time solar wind data is, is, is basically what you're looking at. And I think that a lot of times when the media picks up this activity, they're looking at those KP indexes. And the KP indexes are formed based on Boulder, Colorado. And that's, that's basically their easy predictions, um, you know, for people that just you know, just want to look at it from the surface value. And, and again, there are people that go so in depth on all of this information that I don't even, I can't, this is it for me. This is as far as I'm going to go in depth on the science end of it. So again, this is kind of a quick guide. We want your speed to be higher than 300. I don't know so much about protons. I don't look at them. I look at the BT and the BZ. And I look at basically at this point, KP is insignificant for me. And I look at the gigawatts. So that's kind of an important scale, you know, to look at. So the KP index will never give you current or future. It'll only tell you the past and different solar events have different trends in the data. You know, Aurora strength can be, you know, for many different reasons. We want real time solar weather is what we look at. Uh, it gives us 45 to 90 minute warnings of future activity. And sometimes that tells us, the speed tells us how many days it's gonna be till it actually enters. And we wanna look at the ovation model. We wanna look at current activity by location. So that's basically what the summary is of the predictions I'm talking about. So how does this trans translate? So here you go, here's March 25th. And Margaret, I, I was just so happy that this was one of the dates that you picked because there was absolutely no activity in the Midwest on this day. And so if you take a look at your satellite image, you'll see how high that Aurora is. And this was actually a, an absolutely rock star night in Alaska. This is, th these are just, I, I probably have a thousand images from this night. I had six or seven people with me on this trip. I had a lot of new people. Uh, I'm not an expert photographer by all means, but I will help people to focus your camera at night, to learn your camera in the dark, to use minimal flashlights because it blows your eyes, to enjoy it, what you see, to get the images you want to get. My images, I started imaging in 2012. They were, I was so thrilled that I saw green on my, on my images. I couldn't even tell you. They're terrible. But um, so the, this Aurora this night was so fast and so bright that I was taking two second um, long exposures instead of 30 second or 15 seconds. I, there was so much color to these that was viewable with a naked eye. And I was trying to freeze frame so I could get that structure and not just get a blur. This also, Margaret mentioned, was, a, was kind of a brighter night. This was a full moon. In several of these, you'll see the moon coming up. I 
uh, worked with the photographers this night to put your uh, f-stop up a little bit to sunburst your your moon so you have a little sunburst moon instead of a just a blobby white so if you take a look in the lower left corner you'll see what the aurora oval looked like in the midwest it looked like not much but in alaska that was crazy and so i th this particular week in alaska we are eight nights not a cloud in the sky for eight nights auroras every night auroras when we got off the plane we saw it from the plane when we went to the airport there's the aurora the, the aurora going right over the city of fairbanks and we saw it when we when we you know got back in the plane to leave so it was really a remarkable week so this is this is pretty much um I look at what this what this data tells me because I need to know what it's going to look like in my region and so what's important for the Midwest or what's important for the lower 48 knowing that it doesn't take much for a show like this to occur in Alaska. So this is the 25th and this is the 26th again very I mean very schmidzy you know small aurora the oval is is real small it's not big by all means and so the midwest i polled it, several groups to say does anybody have an image from this night and there was nobody that imaged not one person imaged um, the aurora this night from from minnesota or wisconsin or michigan but this is what we got when we were in uh, alaska because that was the same week now one thing i will tell you is that um, every image that anyone ever takes of the Aurora, you know, we're not expert photographers. We do a lot of post-processing. Post-processing helps to bring out colors. I will tell you this, these colors are very pale, even in, even compared to the last screen that I showed you, I had to tone these down. They were so bright and so neon that I would, that even at two second exposure, I was blowing out the light. And so in order for me to tone it down, I got a lot of this white, but it was that or neon green that people would look at and say, I don't believe you. I don't believe that that's what you saw. In Alaska, um, Tromso, Norway, Finland, you see these colors. You don't see these colors down here. You see white. And you see on the strong nights, you do see hints of green and hints of purple and the hints of the colors. But most of the aurora is really captured from the sensors of the camera because they see what our eyes can't see because we can't take long exposures like a camera could. So this is just an example of that second night. So what I want to talk about, or just to, to finalize my session here, here is an Aurora Oval that is unbelievable. Where you see the red, there's a 90% to 100% chance you're going to see Aurora's. And then it goes down the scale to 10 to 20% chance. This particular night was June 22nd into June 23rd of 2015. And this is what the Aurora Oval ended up looking like close to midnight. So basically approximately 9.30 PM, I was heading back to the Lodi area from Madison. I was on I-9094 and I'm heading north and I looked into the sky and it's like, there it was, I saw the lights. Very, very high in the sky, shooting up into the sky, unbelievable. And so I diverted to Lake Wisconsin. I was trying to figure out the, where's the closest place I can find open north that had some sort of, you know, not so much light pollution, trying to get where I could at least set the camera. I ended up in Lake Wisconsin on Wayland's Great. I don't know if anybody's familiar where that is. It's a, it's a little road. It's a road that goes through an edge of Lake Wisconsin. There's a back bay on one side. It faces Tipperary Point, which is a little hill that's on the other side of Lake Wisconsin. It sticks out in between the, the lake and the river. And then behind it is north in the Baraboo Bluffs. So I diverted to Whalen's grade. Um, interestingly enough, by the time it hit midnight, the gigawatts were 98, which is absolutely stunning. The BZ at some point was minus 37.82. And then probably close to one or two in the morning, it was probably 20 minus 23, which brought all that activity south. So here we are, we're in Lake Wisconsin, and this is what we see. And I am not kidding you, these colors were vivid that night. Um, and this, this is from Southern Wisconsin, Northern Wisconsin, Northern Michigan, Northern Minnesota, there they have unbelievable images. But basically the, the upper left, when I first 
pulled up, that's what it looked like all across the entire sky. And this is moving like crazy. I did not have, I did not use 10 or 15 second image, uh, images. I couldn't because I wanted that structure and the the large image on the right. That was what I remember the most from that night because it was almost blue on the top. And you could see that with your, with your eyes. And so if you, the lower left is the back bay. So I'm looking a little bit more east. You can see some puffy clouds moving in. And so this was the activity. So the nights that you start to see the gigawatts go up, the BZ go down, um, the, you want it negative, the BT go up. Those, those are the, that's the data you look at to say, is this gonna be the activity in my, in my area? Since that time, this is 2015. Um, also in 2015, we had, uh, St. Patrick's Day, just a huge, huge display. I missed it completely, wasn't even paying attention. Um, and there were a couple other nights that I can recall since I started doing this from 2012 on. I've got some from Sun Prairie that were just, and, I, I, and a fellow photographer took one right from, the, from campus, right from the Union, right across Lake Mendota. And so pay attention to those couple of numbers and you'll be more successful in your trip or your, or your uh, goal to, to image the, the Aurora. Again, you're gonna use the, um, just for some quick camera settings, for those that, are, that have cameras and want to do this, you want the lowest f-stop you can find. You wanna keep your ISO as low as possible to keep your noise down, but sometimes you have to raise it up a little bit. I start at 800 and go up or down from there. And you, you based on your focal length, you, you uh, decide what shutter speed, you don't wanna get star trails. You wanna make sure if you do not have a focused image, I don't care what, how good you are of a photographer, you won't have good images. So you've gotta focus your lens during the day and tape it down or learn how to focus it at night. And so that's kind of some of the things that I go through with the people that travel with me. Um, I put out feel, I've got a, quite a bit of people, I've got several that have traveled several times with me and again, we're all amateurs. I help them out as much as possible. And they're thrilled, as thrilled as I am to, to see the lights again, you know, over and over again. And so I've, I've done trips to Tromso. In fact, I uh, had eight people in a rural area of Norway, about four hours away from Tromso, the, the night that it was announced that they were shutting the, air, the airports down for COVID. And so we had a little bit of a scramble to get back, but we made it back in time before anybody's flights were canceled. It was just a, it just shortened our trip and it was a little scary, but um, we did get back. And now I've, I'm taking 11 people uh, one week in Ale to Alaska in, in end of September into October. In another week, I'm taking four people. I'm scouting Iceland myself with a couple of people in September before I open that up to, to let people come. It, it's, it, when I retire, which I, you know, I'm hoping to in the next year or so, I, I'll plan more trips and, and you know, do a little bit more advertising and, and maybe look at it as a business. Right now, I really haven't. I've just looked at, at, it, at it giving people opportunities to go places they've never seen before. And then again, the night of uh, June 22nd, 23rd, which just happens to be six years from tonight, this is what it looked like when I shot straight up, straight up overhead. There was actually Aurora overhead in Lake Wisconsin. So that's pretty phenomenal to have that happen. And then there's Tromso, Norway. That is the place. This These images are common. And, and this was a night in Tromso that was just unbelievable. Unbelievable night to film. You've got, and you've got such beautiful composition. So that's it for me. Thank you very much, Dixie. Uh, Margaret, did you want to chime in with anything before we go to uh, Q and A? Only wow, that's so amazing. <laughs> And Dixie, I learned a lot too. Thank you so much. Well, Beautiful I was afraid, pictures. I was afraid. I was afraid we would we would be like selling, you know, basically presenting the same thing. But then I realized after looking at yours, it it's totally from a different perspective. I yeah. look at it. I look at it from what I'm looking at. Is it worth me getting out of bed and going out in the middle of the night when I got to work the next day? You know. Right, That's and I get high. to look at it with coffee in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> That's a great high standard, Dixie. I like that. Thanks. Um, do the two of you have any questions for each other before we open it up for other folks? No, no. Okay. Um, 
Bia, are you there? And would you like to uh, start off with any questions from the chat? Yeah, um, the first question in the chat is about the cameras. I know you touched on this a little bit, uh, Dixie, but Alex asked, what is the lowest resolution a camera needs to capture it? How many megapixels? Uh, I, I've had people with crop sensor cameras, which with the low megapixels, it, it all, you, you have to go on manual and you have to have a camera that will take a lens with the lowest f-stop possible. That That's actually more important than the megapixels of your camera. I've seen people with 20, I've seen people with 40, I've seen people with 50 uh, megapixels. And really, it, I've seen people with lower end Canon Rebels that can get successful pictures. It's just based on if you have a lens that's a fast lens that has a 2.8 f-stop or lower, and then you you learn to focus it and you learn to set your ISO. These cameras, the one thing I will tell you is that if you don't have a higher megapixel or a full frame, you will get a little bit more noise. You, you want to be able to keep that ISO as low as possible. But again, the, I had a Rebel and I didn't take it the first time to Alaska because it's not weatherproofed. It's more important that you have a camera that's gonna function when it's that cold if you're in Northern climates. And then Dixie, can you remind me, uh, cause I, well, can you tell me what is lower when you say f-stop 2.8 is 2.5 lower than 2.8 or is yeah, 2 it's, it's okay. wider, it's faster. If, if they, if they, if they talk about a fast lens, it's one that, that, that goes to a lower f-stop, which means that it opens up the aperture. So you get more light into the camera. And so even though it's a lower number, it's a wider aperture. Good. And so the big, the, 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 like a 22 F stop is a real small, small aperture that doesn't let in much light. And you use that because you have more light, but because you're in the dark, you, you know, it first sees the dark and you want it to be able to, to see the light in the sky in at infinity, basically, because you're, you're, you're really focusing on infinity. So I have a couple lenses that are 1.4 or 1.2. And, and it's phenomenal. I can take, I can use lower ISO and I can use lower shutter speed. So instead of having 10 seconds, I'm able to be able to use three or four because I've got my aperture up so wide. That's what they call fast lens. Very good. Uh, do, would anybody like to chime in and ask a question of either Dixie or Margaret? Uh, if not, uh, Bia, if you'd like to go on to the next question in the chat. Yeah, um, first Sandy Rotter has put in some interesting links to different articles and um, other happenings that seem to relate to this talk. Um, and then I'll go to the question. The next question is how much has climate change affected the magnetism of Earth's poles? Yeah, on my pay grade. Yeah, it's, I, I can't answer that either. I, I don't know if even people, I, I don't know. I can't answer that. I can't think how it would affect it. Yeah. But I, I, I don't know if it does or not. Maybe the ozone layer is thinner and therefore we get more activity. I, I don't know. I don't know. Perfectly good idea to say, I don't know. When you yeah. don't know. <laughs> what I learned in college. <laughs> Actually, the University of Wisconsin looked at that back around 1850 or 60. And uh, if you look at the, uh, I forgot the talk uh, that was given at Wednesday Night to Labs. There's a photo of the building on uh, on the hill uh, where where, the, where they made those magnetic measurements to see if the weather was affected. Yeah, I think they were looking the other way around. What happens when you um, change the weather? Does that affect the magnetism? But either way, that's a long time ago. That's good. Yeah. Um, Bia, go ahead and with the next question. I don't see any more in the chat. Okay. Very good. Um, Margaret, you mentioned that you want to go along with uh, one of Dixie's trips. Do you want to ask her how you actually get to do that? <laughs> well, sure. 
Dixie, how's that work? I reach out okay. to you. And I, you say where you know, Right now I have probably 40 to 50 people that have probably gone on trips with me um, in since 2013, basically. And I started opening up to more people because people would say, gosh, I'd love to go. I'd love to go. I'd love to go. And so I, I have a couple groups that I advertise in. Um, I have a lot of friends now that are photographers and I'll, I normally put out a post on Facebook and say, I'm thinking about a group. I'm thinking about a trip there, you know, anybody interested and then I'll start to get information. And th then I wait to see how many people have interest. And then I decide, okay, what am I going to do? I did a lot of, a lot of trips. And then I would do a side trip in the middle of the week because I want people to see if it's, if it's, you know, bad weather, I want them to see these sites. I don't want them just to go and be disappointed because you didn't get any night sky activity. So I try to plan all of this daytime stuff as well, knowingly knowing that you can't be up 24 hours a day. So if you, if the night sky is always priority, always priority. So I right now haven't really set this up as a business. So I haven't full blown advertised, but that being said, because of COVID and everybody is just restless. When I put it out there that I was thinking about doing a trip, I had so many people that I, I, you know, even taking 11 is a lot of people to take in one trip. Now, luckily, probably nine of those are people that have gone with me before. So they know what to expect and I know what to expect. And so I ask everyone to pitch in, help cook, help clean, help, you know, cause we're all living together like a family, you know, we're sharing a, a house and, um, I usually ask people to drive at this time. I actually rented a, a nine passenger sprinter van. So this is going to be kind of interesting. I, I'm figuring it's going to slow my roll a little bit. I have a tendency to go a little too fast on some of these roads in Alaska. So I think driving this big sprinter van is going to take care of that. But um, next year I plan on cutting back my work schedule. I was going to flat out retire, but now I might stay on a little bit longer and then I'm probably going to organize and do this more as a, as, as, as a side job. And I want to do six to eight weeks next week, next year for sure. Cool. Yeah. Well, I, I know I'm, uh, I'm a member in one of Dixie's Facebook groups too. So I follow her that way too. Yeah. I try to stay active, but you know, I used to be, I used to just pour over the night. I, you know, there's, there's, there's night, there's cameras everywhere now, all over Lapland, all over Alaska. And I used to watch these things at night and look at all, all this activity and go, Oh my gosh, I wish I was there. And, you know, now I kind of don't do that anymore, but I plan my trips and I hope that, you know, that I get lucky and I, and I, we've been lucky and we've been unlucky, but that I make sure that we see a whole lot of things that people can say, yeah, I went to Alaska and I saw Alaska. So, um, so that's how, basically how I do it. Cool. And Margaret we went to Iceland, Iceland for the first time and we're going to go right when it's finally dark. So I'm hoping to get some good intel on that so I can open it up to, to take people to Iceland as well. And what do we know about the uh, Aurora Australis, Australis, however it's pronounced, and how do you get to see those? Are there cameras at McMurdo and the South Pole? And can you have um, tourism folks go to those places? Sure enough, New Zealand is probably the most popular. The one thing that I've noticed, I, there are groups that are just for the uh, Australis, but there, I don't see as many photographers down there, which is amazing to me. But I don't, I don't know if it's because it's, you know, lower populated places. I don't know. I don't see a whole lot out of there. But we do, we do encourage people to join our groups and we do look at other groups. And, you know, Facebook has been phenomenal for this, for this hobby. You know, when I first started in 2012, 2013, I was barely on Facebook. And so I was so thrilled though, to post my first couple of pictures. When I saw green, it was like, you know, it was hysterical. It was about minus 58. I was on top of a mountain and I had a remote shutter, but it was a wired remote shutter and the wire froze. And so halfway in the middle, all of a sudden, here's my wire hanging and it's frozen. And I'm like, ah, oh, what do I do? What do I do? You know, and I think it's going to be gone in five minutes, you know, oh my God, I got to get all the, as many pictures as possible. So I finally, you know, I settled down now, <laughs> but there are times like, you know, a couple of those nights we were hooting and hollering. That was pretty impressive to see this Aurora fly across the sky. You swear you hear it, but you don't, it's completely silent and you just see it just go across the sky and you can't not, you can't help but be excited. Yeah. That's one of the things, like I said, in my missive, I have 
I'm always expecting music. I know. Many, but it's like, come on, we had music for Fantasia. We need to have music. For- <laughs> well, and people say they can hear them and they sound like a hissing noise and electricity and they yeah. you can't hear them. It's a, it, space is a vacuum. You know, you can't hear them. <laughs> so tell me, how do you stay warm at 58 below? I'm assuming that's Fahrenheit. I've learned. Yes, it is. I've learned. I've learned many, many things since I first started out. I've learned. Um, I've, I've Baffin Island boots, which are, are good for minus 150. Uh, I don't believe it, but they are the best boots I've ever owned. I use, I use toe warmers like crazy. I use hand warmers. Um, I, you have to have snow pants. You have to have another layer and you have to have an under layer. You have three layers. And plus I bought, um, I bought a musher's jacket from Fairbanks that, that they actually make them there. It's called apocalypse designs. They are phenomenal coats and I won't go, I won't go anywhere without that coat. And then I wear, I wear several layers on my hands because I want to touch my cameras. I learn. I, oh, I also, this is my key. Anyone that goes anywhere in, in cold weather buy a hunter's muff. It, the one that just straps around your waist and you can put your hands in it phenomenal. You can leave your batteries in there. So they stay warm. You put your warmers in there. One hand's always in there. I'm looking at my camera, doing camera settings and stuck it right back into my muff. Um, I actually hold on to hand warmers in the palm of my hand when I'm using, when I'm doing camera settings, because I only have a light glove on, I can't have a big glove on and you can't, you can't handle it. Um, face masks, balaclava, absolutely have to good hats on top of it. All the heat comes out of your head. Um, we never go anywhere that the car is not close by and running, especially if it's minus 50. Um, you have to have your car running. You can't, you can't risk not having it. We're way off the grid. Sometimes we're hundred miles off out of, out of Fairbanks. Um, worst thing I ever did, which was the best thing I ever did was go to Barrow at the very Northern tip on the Arctic sea. It was minus about nice 64, I think. And the wind was blowing like mad. So the wind chill was like minus 70 something. And I was trying to set my camera up on the beach, which you're not supposed to go to because polar bears, but I wanted just like two, two quick pictures of the ice and the steam coming off of the ocean. And that's all I got. And turn around, took a picture of, of the city is just covered in ice. And it was just so cold. The next day we went right back to Fairbanks. So um, you learn a lot when you go and, conditions like that. The cool thing about Norway is that Tromso is the Gulf stream heads through the Arctic up to Norway. And so you have open water and rarely does it get below zero. So if you want to go someplace where you're not risking the minus thirties, minus forties, Norway is, is it Finland cold, very, very cold. You're inland. It's cold. And what about Iceland? Um, I, I don't know. Iceland. I haven't been to yet, but I don't think Iceland gets, Iceland doesn't get sub-zero temperatures, but they have a lot of wind and you have to be really careful. And because of the wind and because they're, they're so close to sea level, they get a lot of ice everywhere. And so in the winter, you got to be really careful. The reason why I'm going September is because that's the first time that you've got about 12, 14 hours of night. And so that'll be my best bet and, and it won't be snow yet, but it could, but it could start to snow and be windy. So We'll and, um, I'm just thinking Scotland or the Orkneys, any, any um, indication of those? Scotland, I see pictures coming out of Scotland. I think Scotland's a little bit lower um, yeah. in latitude. So I think it's going to be similar to maybe Southern Canada. I'm really not sure about that, but um, yeah, I, I, I would go to those places. I, I, we also went, I don't know if you've ever heard of Senya Island I have in, not. in Norway. You see a lot of pictures coming out of there. And so we went there. We went there last February and uh, it snowed like crazy and they have tunnels and they closed the tunnels when it snows. And it was, it was really quite frightening. We were afraid we were going to get landlocked into one of these little villages, but um, it was, it was awesome. Just beautiful, but we had really bad weather. So what we did is we bugged out, went to Finland and Finland is we, you know, we saw where the clouds were. We went and found clear skies and found the auroras, but it was just remarkably more cold. I got a little whiff of Jack London there when you were talking about, you know, Point Barrow and all that. I was oh, like, yeah. I, I hope you can light your matches and keep them things warm. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, it's cold up there. There's no doubt about it. Finland too gets darn cold, but it's, it's beautiful. And the country is just, you know, it, it is just so beautiful. It, it really is. It's um, Trump. So Norway is, it's yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. Any other questions? Has anything popped in, uh, Bia? Yes, we do have some questions in the chat. Um, the first one is, why is magnetism necessary for the interaction between solar wind and atmospheric elements? Well, it, it steers it. Yeah. Apparently, it steers the uh, uh, solar wind and it steers the energy from the sun towards our poles. Yeah. And when it's this like a highway. Yeah. Right. And when the energy, when it, you know, when it's, when it steers in, it depends upon if it goes North or South. And it also, it's this, it's this energy that comes in that absolutely activates all of the, the elements in our, in our atmosphere. And so that's what causes the Aurora. It's like the charge. And then our next question um, is what legends are about Aurora? Norwegian Eskimos Lapish um, and how do they describe it? Uh, there's a lot, well, I probably know a little bit more about Alaska legends, you know, about the souls of their past, uh, past the ancestors. Um, I don't know a whole lot about the legends. You know, everybody talks about the Japanese and they talk about the legends that they, you know, want to procreate under the Aurora because they think it brings them good luck. Um, I actually don't believe that. I believe that the Japanese, they flock to Alaska, which they do. And I think it's because they, they love the technology of it. And I, that's what I think. And I, I mean, I've seen busloads of them and they're just, they're just ecstatic underneath the, the Aurora when it's out. Um, as far as, you know, I, one thing I am going to say too, is I'm a co, um, a co-organizer for a weekend event in Northern Wisconsin. It's going to be this year called the Aurora Summit. The Aurora Summit, we've had a similar meeting for about seven, eight years. Um, the Aurora Summit, this is, would be our, will be our third. And we have speakers come from all over the place that for that talk about all aspects of night photography and also the Aurora. And there's a lot on the Aurora Summit about the myths. And so if you go to the aurorasummit.com, you will see uh, a presentation about the myths. And it's a, a good place. It's it look at look at um, files, I think it is. And you'll see a presentation about the myths about the Aurora. We, my co-organizer, Melissa Kalen, she is a writer and she is the one that probably provides that end of it. I'm more the photographer, science person. And then we have another co-producer that is a astro, um, astrophysicist. So he's another co-organizer, Mike Shaw. I don't know if you're Mike Shaw photography, but I encourage you to go to the Aurora Summit, the Aurora Summit .com and check it out. Any others, Bia? Um, that's all I see in the chat. Sounds good. Um, before we sign off, I want to remind everybody that uh, I'll be heading from here to the terrace tonight. If you'd like to come in person to the Memorial Union Terrace, uh, the one on Lake Mendota. Um, once a year, I, we gather on this Solstice Wednesday night, and I'll buy, and uh, if anybody can come on down, that'd be great. I'd also like to congratulate Bia. She got her, had the good news. Do you want to tell them, Bia, about your good news? Yeah, sure. I just accepted a position as a clinical research coordinator at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Oh, oh congratulations. congratulations. Thank congratulations. you. And when do you start? Um, I think the official start date is August 2nd. Okay. So now I have to find somebody to, to do what you do for me on Wednesday night at the lab. Replacement. <laughs> oh, no. Well, that's great news. Way to go. Um, thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Dixie. And thank you. Know. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. I'm thinking I want to see the... Aurora from the top of Mount Aloha or something like that on the island of Hawaii. You should look <laughs> there will be no electricity if that happens because it'll knock out our grid. <laughs> well, 
I didn't say I necessarily had to see it. I just wanted to be up there at night and, you know, if something happens, that's great. That, that 59 below. Whew. Yeah, that's it was brutal. Pain. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> thanks again, everybody. And I think um, I'm just trying to remember what's up for next week. Uh, we'll have Adam Beckley on eroding coastlines of the Great Lakes. Thanks again for coming tonight. Um, it's a great celestial show. I appreciate both speakers, all the angles that you presented to us. And uh, I'll look forward, Margaret, again, to setting up a speaker for Sims about this time next year. Sounds good. All right. Thank you all Thank very you. much.